I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope, of your calling. Hello, welcome back to Bethel Evangelical Free Church Hanley on YouTube. In this video I'm continuing seri the series on these old Cunningham lectures. We got through some of the rather dreary ones, I think particularly of A.B. Macaulay, Death of Jesus, and we're on to the last three in this series. In this video I want to talk about this rather wonderful volume, I think, Christian Vocation, Studies in Faith and Work by W.R. Forrester, Professor of Christian Ethics and Practical Theology, St. Mary's College, University of St. Andrews. These were the 1950 Cunningham Lectures. The 40s were all about the Second World War, the immediate aftermath, the question of what world shall we have? And by 1950, there was something of a, a crisis in terms of what is the future to be? Although England, Britain, Scotland are still very much dominated by some form of at least cultural Christianity, yet there were stresses and strains already beginning to show. And William Roxburgh Forrester, in his a fairly short volume, actually. It's, uh, it's about 200 pages. Deals with this great question of vocation, faith and work. Well, who was W.R. Forrester? Just a, a few biographical points, because this is such a, a good book, I want to spend more time on the book than on the man. He was born in 1892 and died in 1984. He was the first professor of practical theology and Christian ethics at St Andrews University and came from a long line of ministers. Both his father and grandfather were ministers and at least one of his sons became a pastor. He studied in Glasgow University where he came first in mental philosophy and when he began his ministry he served as a pastor in the toughest slums of Edinburgh. He worked in slum parishes. Because of the fact that he worked in slum parishes, he was one of those men who refused to wear a clerical collar. It was quite normal in those days for Scottish Presbyterian ministers, whether they were Church of Scotland or Free Church of Scotland or anything in between, and certainly the Free Presbyterians wore them. Clerical collars were normal in the 1950s. It's only in recent years that it's become more normal for Presbyterian ministers and Baptist ministers in Britain not to wear these collars, which began as Protestant collars, but that's enough about that. He was a, noted as a sworn total abstainer, but he was not a pacifist, at least not in the absolute sense. Well, as I say, he was professor at St Andrews, and... He wrote or gave the Cunningham Lectures at the time of uh, a time of uncertainty. The war was past, a new world was emerging, and this new world, it became apparent, was in part defined by the Cold War, the conflict between the capitalist West and the communist East. The Soviet Union was, it seemed, the potential, probable enemy in some future war, and was the, the enemy in an ongoing conflict of ideas. It was also a, a time when, because finances were picking up, people were thinking in a more materialistic fashion. He writes in his introduction, The climate of our time is peculiarly inhospitable to the life of the spirit. For one thing, we now live in an age of speed, where our souls have no opportunity to catch up on our bodies. And a revolutionary and breathless change gives us no time to plan the direction in which we ought to move, or to formulate the purposes 
our new skills and gadgets should serve. Well, this was 1950, 70 years ago. <laughs> Not much has changed in 70 years. We've got faster, of course. We've gone from the airliner. Well, Concorde didn't work. The supersonic airline didn't work. But we're now talking about space flight. We've now got super fast internet. And we're trying to get faster and faster all the time. We now live in a, an on-demand culture. In the 1950s, if you wanted to watch television, your choices were very limited. You went on, turned on the BBC, and what's on the BBC tonight? That sort of thing. When I was a lad, it was uh, four channels, and then Channel 5 came along, and we couldn't watch it because the reception on Channel 5 was so bad that you watched everything with a snowstorm, but that's another matter. But now, of course, the internet means we've got on-demand television, on-demand listening. The idea you've got to sit and wait for something physically to be delivered, or you've got to, to look at the Radio Times, at the listings magazine, or whatever listings magazine you might be using, or the listings in the newspaper, and say, well, OK, here's this programme's on, and that programme's on at the same time, and which one are we going to videotape, and which one are we going to watch at the time? And if there's three on at the same time, tough. That just isn't the way people think anymore. So immediately we see this is a book that's looking to the future, but we still live in the, the future that he's looking to. The intellectual climate makes faith difficult. We live in an age of relativity where there are no longer any absolutes, and without absolutes the soul cannot live. Postmodernism was in infancy then. Today, this postmodernism, this relativism, is all pervasive. But also, in physics, Einstein is one of only many thinkers who established the reign of relativity and the contingency of many supposed absolute laws of nature, which of course has nothing to do with relativity of any other things. But there we go. In biology, Darwin stands for the triumph of the category of evolution over all former static conceptions. In economics, Marx is supposed to have reduced all our patterns of behaviour to terms of economic pressures and class conflicts, with the result that all our social structures, political, ecclesiastical and cultural, are supposed to be determined by their economic foundations or lack of them, and so on. We live in this world, and this world has carried on developing. What is to be done, then, in terms of Christianity? Another issue, of course, is that we live in an age that has become somewhat cynical. Before 1914, for a man to be called an idealist was a compliment. Now, thanks to Marx and Freud, it is a reproach and means that he is building castles in Spain and is a prey to illusions, and even, we might say, delusions. But this is the world in which we have to live. How do we deal with living in this world, a world that is very largely, to use a, a technical term, it is materialistic. Now, the term materialistic has two, two meanings, really, in common speech. The one that we most often use is to, to say not that it's a, an ideology in which matter is all there is. It is rather to say that matter is all that matters, the material. We talk of a materialistic conception of life, meaning that life's about getting stuff. And that, of course, is the attitude that our advertising is all about. It's get this and all things will be wonderful. But we've seen also, in terms of a materialistic view of life, through this coronavirus pandemic. Because the great concern of the government has been simply a matter of physical health. There has not been the concern that there ought to have been about mental health and the effects of things like lockdowns and how they can be somehow mitigated. There has, of course, been absolutely no concern about spiritual health because, very largely, I'm afraid, the re rejoinder of our materialistic culture to language of spiritual health is to say, well, what's that? The idea of human beings as having a, a spiritual component has almost been lost. 
Our age has now several examples before it of contemporary urgency, in which we have seen apparently moribund and apathetic multitudes galvanised into startling, violent, purposeful, concerted activity on a heroic level, on a heroic level at the bidding of a man of destiny, who succeeded in convincing them individually that their lives could become worthwhile, and that their nation could regain its sense of vocation and shake off its apathy. Germany seemed to experience a genuine rebirth under Hitler, and Italy under Mussolini, and a new phase in the strange history of Russia began with Lenin's coming to power. We now realise that the mass mind is the raw material out of which the titans have hammered their powerful weapons, and yet have we any right to say that what has happened to leaders and peoples in Italy, Germany and Russia is titanism, while what happened here in 1940 and through the war years under Churchill was due to a real sense of vocation? What, after all, is this sense of vocation, and how does it differ from, the, from ruthless ambition in, in individual and lawless nationalism and imperialism in a people? Because vocation, the sense of calling, is a, a deeply Christian thing. It's been said that one of the things that was rediscovered at the Reformation was the idea of life as vocation, as calling. But what it has tended to mean in everyday life and certainly in careless and foolish speeches given by people, whether those speeches are given on political platforms or from pulpits or stages in churches that don't have pulpits, what's generally happened is that instead of talking about how vocation is how we serve our neighbour, it's become a matter of be somebody great, be somebody important, you are the chosen one. Well, no, you're not the chosen one. In David and Goliath, that great story about King David facing that Philistine giant, we miss the whole point of the story if we think the story is about me and my sense of destiny. No, the story is about a people who need a deliverer and God giving them a deliverer. And you and I, we are not David. David is the king. David is the Lord's anointed. We are the people who cannot fight this enemy, but God sends a deliverer to fight him for us. And of course that deliverer is the Lord Jesus Christ. Our vocation is not a vocation to be a hero. It's a vocation to serve. And that's one of the things that Forrester goes through in this wonderful book. There are many, many quotes that one could take complaining about the way the word, the word vocation is used today. He says, in current use, vocation means merely a career. Who was the agent inspired by the evil one to apply the word career to human affairs? It's a word incapable of redemption, better fitted to describe the motion of a horse than the motive of a man. He opens with these wonderful words. Vocation has been described as one of the lordliest of words. W. M. McGregor, and as the supreme category of religion, J. A. Robertson. But no word is more frequently misunderstood or more frequently misused. The words vocation, call and calling are fully described in the New English Dictionary. Vocation is the calling to serve our neighbour. In And we have many vocations and callings. It's not a matter of ambition. He writes, Jesus was not a man of remarkable spiritual powers with big and ambitious ideas, but a man under orders. We see in him a in a unique way the difference between self-assertion and a true sense of vocation. In anyone else, the claims that he made on any interpretation of them would have been ridiculous even to blasphemy. Jesus wasn't a man who had a big idea. He was a man who knew that he was the Son of God on a mission, that he had a calling, and that calling was a call of service. He was a man under orders, a man under authority, as the centurion said. On duty, Forrester writes, duty is relative, but relative to vocation, not, if one may use the phrase, absolutely relative. 
The idea of absolute obligation cannot be imposed by anyone upon himself. God can impose that on you, but you can't impose that upon yourself. But if we accept the gospel teaching about God and Jesus and ourselves and the classical interpretation of that teaching in St. Paul, we see there is a certain measure of flexibility in our actual conduct, along with an absolute devotion to our Lord. We notice in St. Paul, for example, how apparently contradictory courses may be called for in closely similar circumstances as applications or interpretations of the same principle. Wisdom. Do not answer a fool according to his folly. Answer a fool according to his folly. In different situations, the duty is different, though the situations may seem very similar. And chapter 5 is a wonderful title. Is pacifism a heresy or a vocation? Pacifism, of course, had been a big thing between the walls. Then Hitler came along. What do you do with Hitler if you're a pacifist? Well, one of the things you can do is you can ignore, try to ignore him. What happens when he starts gobbling up little countries? When he starts committing atrocities? What do you do about Hitler? Hitler is a challenge to pacifism. And that meant, of course, that in the Second World War, a good number of former pacifists gave up pacifism. Because they said, well, hang on a minute, pacifism in the face of Hitler looks a lot like defeatism and looks a lot like undermining. Is pacifism a heresy or a vocation? If it's taken as an absolute, everyone should be a pacifist, you've got a problem. If it's a matter that some people are called to be pacifists and not, well, that's another matter slightly. But let me read some quotations. Living as we do in an age that is shadowed by sinister clouds of imminent war, while we still have fresh in our memories the happenings and sufferings of two other wars, we long for one clear and convincing word of God for our guidance in this dominant ethical question of our day. Yet on no other question except possibly the sacraments is Christian thought more divided. Now, there is such a thing as a pacifism that is unequivocally heretical. Pacifism, which is based on a naive belief in the sweetened reasonableness of human nature, is heresy. It's Pelagianism. So Butterfield says of a certain ambassador, such an attitude to morality, such a neglect of a whole tradition of maxims in regard to this question, was not Christian in any sense of the word, but belongs to a heresy, black as the old Manichaean heresy. It was like the bishop who said that if we totally disarmed, he had too high an opinion of human nature to think that anybody would attack us. There might be great virtue in disarming and consenting to be made martyrs for the sake of the good cause, but to promise that we would not have to endure martyrdom in that situation or to rely on such a supposition is against both theology and history. It is essential not to have faith in human nature. Such faith is a recent heresy and a very disastrous one. That's a quotation from Herbert Butterfield, Christianity and History. Now, Forrester takes the view that the pacifist has a vocation to make people think about peace and war. That the pacifist doesn't have a vocation to make other people pacifists. And that pacifism itself is to be regarded not as this is the absolute thing that all Christians must do, but as something, as a bit of a crank idea like the Quakers, but something that inspires us with the vision that perhaps things can be better. He writes again on the question of vocation. Two things distinguish the sense of vocation of the man of God from the self-seeking of the ambitious careerist. First, the former accepts his tasks from God upon his knees, with a deep and humble and penitent sense of responsibility toward another whose servant he is. In an attitude of worship, which, if sincere, is almost an almost perfect antiseptic to arrogance and selfishness. There are, of course, disconcerting instances where men made in a big mould have dominated their fellows, and at the same time have believed and practised a kind of religion that seems to have made them more ruthless because they believed they were the instruments of God. Bismarck, even after a day spent in what seems to us almost diabolical real politique, read his chapter from the Bible, said his prayers and slept like a child. But Bismarck was no moral monster. 
there's much here that is excellent. Here's another, another quote. It's no use offering men freedom when freedom means exploitation or unemployment in times of peace and anonymous destruction in time of war. Men no longer desire such freedom. They are afraid of it. The ballot box means nothing to men whose lives are purposeless, whose work contains no joy, and who are drifting like ships that have lost their moorings and have their steering broken down. Duty is relative, but it is relative to our vocation. That is to say that the minister, and this is after all a, a book that was originally lectures delivered to ministers, or to ministerial students, the minister has a vocation to preach in a way that the layman does not. The engineer has a particular, a peculiar vocation, peculiar duties, that the accountant does not, and the accountant vice versa. Duty is real. And duty is a high word, a good word, a wonderful word. In this book he deals with historical attitudes to work, and why Christianity makes work something that paganism never could. Jesus Christ came into the world as a workman. He deals with the, the issues of communism. Communism, as I say, was a big thing at that point. He writes, The communist ethic cannot treat man, the individual soul, as an end in himself without sacrificing the supreme and absolute authority of the state. On Marxist theory, the state should wither away with the establishment of a class or society, but in practice the state has become as much the be-all and end-all as in fascism. It is probable that only on the religious assessment of the individual does he become an end in himself. The immortality of the soul is the postulate of civil liberty. Sovietism has not escaped from or discovered the antidote to the corrupting influences of industrialism. More and more it becomes apparent that a secular society is a contradiction in set terms, because it can only maintain itself by deifying the state. He deals with the question of value. How can we regard anything as having a value that is not merely economic? without God. Christianity is the, has as its basis the fact that all things on earth are passing away. It's one of the fundamental postulates of Christianity. And that human value, the value of a human being, is not predicated upon the work that we can or cannot do. It is something that is given by Almighty God. Well, I could go on, but I don't want the video to go on for too long. I hope that I've communicated that I like this book. This is a a good book. It's not a perfectly orthodox evangelical book. There are many things in it that make you go hum. But it's a book that makes you think. It's a book that makes you think about this great important subject of Christian vocation. Well, thank you for watching. May God help us all in our vocations to serve and to love one another and to glorify him. Thank you for watching. May God bless you. Amen.